Very good morning and good evening to you from the Stephen R. Covey Leadership Center in the Huntsman School of Business at Utah State University. I'm Professor Boyd Craig and with my co-host and co-professor, Lord Michael Hastings, we warmly welcome you to the Principled Leaders of the World Series. Lord Hastings joins us today from England where he resides and serves in the British Parliament as a lifetime peer in the House of Lords. This series brings to our students leaders of great stature and achievement who've distinguished themselves, not only by their success, but by the way they've achieved that success. As men and women of great competence and great character, anchored in principle as they navigate through constant change and the profound challenges of our day. Our guest today is Professor Muhammad Yunus, founder of the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh, father of the global microcredit and social business movement, and recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize for his life's work to eliminate extreme poverty in the world. We're very honored to have you join us and our students from DACA, Professor Yunus. Good evening and welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Bart. Great to be with you. Well, it's such a pleasure to have you with us. We'd love to jump right in so we make the most of our time. Uh, let me first just ask you, your achievement in creating and building Grameen is so phenomenal. Please take us through the journey since 1983, some 38 years back. Tell us your story. Okay. Well, I never planned for all these things that happened. Those are all accidental things. I never planned to be involved in any kind of banking activity. That's far, far remote from my mind. But uh, as circumstances arose, I was forced into it. And I, at that time, I didn't know that I was getting involved with any banking or anything. This was 1971, the critical year, 1971, the year Bangladesh became in independent, separated from Pakistan. We were the East Pakistan at that time. It's a very uh, harsh uh, war. Many people gave life. Uh, as soon as uh, Bangladesh uh, became independent in the end of 1971, I resigned from my job, which I was doing. I was teaching in uh, one of the universities in uh, Tennessee, Tennessee State University. And I said, I'm going home. Uh, time to go because Bangladesh became independent. I can be useful uh, to people there. So I resigned and I came back to uh, Bangladesh and started teaching at Chittagong University, one of the universities just recently built and so on, fresh new university at the economics department. Then things get worse and worse since 1971. By 74, we had a famine, people dying of hunger all around the country. And I was shocked. Here I am, young teacher, with full of enthusiasm for economics, such a beautiful theory, elegant theory. And I realized that those theories have no meaning to the people who are dying. It's absolutely meaningless. And then I started feeling that uh, I'm a useless person. I wasted all my time to learn something which has no meaning for anybody. So I felt very depressed. I was trying to see how I can find myself uh, some use for me for, to uh, be useful to other people. So one of the things I did, uh, the university where I was teaching is surrounded by villages. So I said, why don't I go to the village? It's the real world right here. So see if I can make myself useful to at least one person, even a day for, for, for something I can do for them. So I used to, I started going to the village, meeting people, talking to people and so on, learning about them, see if I can do for that day, what I can do. And as a result, I got very familiar with them. And I started seeing things which I never saw before, never heard before, never read about it before in economics, like loan sharking. And it's so vivid, so harsh, that it way the loan sharking victimized people. And I was wondering how to protect these people from the loan sharks. And I know the person who is a victim, I know the person who has victimized them. It's, they're all in the same village, same people, I talked to both sides. And they are friends, they're not enemies to each other, but they kind of uh, grab everything from each other. So I thought one way to do that, since economics never taught me how to do it, one way to do that, why don't I lend money to them before they go to the loan charges? If I can lend the money to the person, he or she doesn't have to go to the loan charge. That's an easy solution. 
So I started lending money out of my own pocket. And that was the beginning. This was 1976, the first thing I did. And that was the beginning, step by step, it grew and grew. And at the end, I converted into a bank. It's a long story. I got into a bank because everybody says, crazy bank for the poor people. Uh, no, law, no law existence in such a situation. I said, well, I'll try. So I created the bank called Grameen Bank or Village Bank in 1983. So our work began in 1976 in an informal way. We remained informal out of my own pocket. I started lending money. But we became a formal bank in 1983. And then we kept on expanding and became known as microcredit. Many other stories came with it. So I'll stop here. Wonderful. Along the way and in the beginning, did you find that you had any doubts uh, as you faced the struggle of really trying to establish within the system of your country this banking, banking. and uh, uh, any uh, questions or concerns about the model you were doing with the poor? I had no idea of a model, I was just trying to solve the problem of the people. So whatever worked, I worked. I knew that uh, yeah. I don't know anything. So some things will go wrong, I have to fix it again. So I was not kind of comparing myself with anything because there is nothing to be compared. Uh, the bank said it cannot be done. Very loudly, very openly criticized my work. They said this is a wasteful, wasteful time that you are making and uh, spending uh, because it cannot be done. Poor are not credit worthy. Mm -hmm. I said, look, I'll continue to do it uh, because I think it needs to be done. Whether it can be done or not, that's not my concern. My concern, it has to be done. So I'll, I'll continue until it starts working. Hmm. Uh, so I had to believe that it, I, I can find a way to do that. And I continue to do that. Not that everything worked as I went on, but I kept on. It's a trial and error thing. So I will never hmm. feel uh, left out that, oh, my God, I made a mistake. No, I didn't feel it. This is the way you find a way. When you are work, working through a forest, you don't have a path to follow. You figure out. you cross this way and come to the, you do that. Ultimately, your goal is to get to the destination. That's what I was doing. Yes. But in the meantime, I got, got into lots of controversy with the bankers. And I started saying, your bank is wrong. Your banking system is designed absolutely in the wrong way. Banks are supposed to lend money to people. You do it in a very funny way. You lend the money to people who already have lots of money. And you don't lend the money to people who don't have money. I said, the real thing would be the opposite. You should be lending money to people who don't have money. And then when you exhaust it, then you go to them. And people ask me, how did you design your bank that it works? I said, it was very simple for me. I never had a course in, in uh, uh, banking. I didn't know anything. So whenever I needed a policy, policy procedure, I look at the conventional bank, how they do it. Once I learn how they do it, I just do the opposite. Hmm. They go to the rich, I go to the poor. They go to men, I go to women. They go to the city, I go to the village. They look for collateral in every case. I said, forget about collateral. doesn't matter what loan size is, et cetera. Et cetera. It's, an, it's a bank without collateral because we are working with the poor people. If they do it, forget it. Uh, so everything we did in the reverse way. And I said, instead of bank, people going to the bank, banks would go to the people. So we do reverse the whole thing. Our mm -hmm. entire system is about bank going to the people. We, it's a doorstep banking. Still, it's after many years now, it's still it's a doorstep banking. Now it works in many countries, including mm -hmm. USA. USA has a very big program right now. And it follow absolutely to the dot. Whatever we do in Bangladesh, uh, we do it in elsewhere too. So this is how it works. Very good. You know, I remember it's been some 25 years ago, Stephen Covey and I interviewed you in New York. And at the time we asked you this question about how your vision for microcredit developed. Your response was, more that you had adopted a bird's eye view as opposed to a worm's eye view or the opposite. Could you elaborate on the difference between those two and what you mean by that? Yeah, I remember uh, this was in reference to my going to the village. I said, I was telling you uh, the, the difference that it made when I came to the village from the, because I crossed the boundary of the, um, university, and I'm right in the thousand year old village, so I'm real world. I said, uh, the way I have done that, I started realizing that for the first time, I'm learning something about people and the world and their life and so on. Economics never taught me anything. These are all artificial discussions. 
These are real people, real issues, real things we have to do. And I said, this is my real university. I'm learning now. And the people here are my teacher. They are my professors. They're every day, they're telling me things which I never learned about. So they, I admire them for being my professor, be teaching me what the real life is all about. Mm. And I they look around, what did, did I do at the university? I said, the university is a place where you fly high and you see a lot of things at once glance because underneath you see everything because you're too high, so you see a lot. And that's your bird's eye view. In a bird's eye view, you see a lot, but actually don't see anything very clearly mm. because the further you go, your eyesight get blurred. Mm. In the blurred eyesight, you make up all kinds of stories about people, about things. It is a, it's a half a story, half reality, or maybe 90% uh, story and 10% reality. This is real, 100% real, because it's, I said, instead of bird's eye view, for the first time I realized I have one side view. I see things very too, but I see it very clearly. And to me, what the, in the university looked big problem, I come here, I see it's a simple problem, but they made it into a big problem. And they got so scared of the big problem, they're gonna touch it. I touch it every day. And I know that I can handle it because it's right there in front of me. It's a human problem. Human problem cannot be complicated. You go come to it, it's a human to human thing. You have to resolve it by two uh, human beings getting together. So I started seeing them many, microcredit is one thing. In the meantime, I got involved with many other issues and everything is working because I'm in people to people kind of configuration. So I said, my worm side view gave me the reality, uh, exposure to the reality. And that's what made me things which I didn't see before. And I didn't think I could do before, but now I see I can do it as much as I could. So with this worm's eye view, what you're saying is that the key is that you see the need right in front of you. That, you know, with exactly. your heart, with your mind, with your talent, with your conscience, you see that need and you respond and meet that need. And it sounds like because that was your mode from the beginning, from the first time that you saw the needs of these villagers, that your focus became creating solutions that met that need. Do you see that as a, as a viable model for business today? Uh, of course, it's a, the business today is a different kind of animal. It's not a people's problem solving animal. This is a money making animal. So they sniff money, wherever money will take, they will go there. They are not driven by people's need or anything. That's the struggle that I had to make along the way. I created many businesses along the way to solve people's problem. And I had no intention of making money at all. So it's zero dividend business that I created. I did the uh, healthcare businesses in the village, uh, expanded it throughout the country. Uh, I had the solar energy company, expanded it to the whole country and big millions of people have the uh, solar energy, solar home system at home as a business. They have to pay for it, but pay just the cost of it. Nothing for me. So I'm not uh, earning, I'm not looking for that. That's the business I call social business. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a uh, problem driven business, problem solving business. The conventional business is a money making business. And the first lesson you learn in economics, you have to maximize profit. And the first lesson you learn in economics, human being is driven by self interest. I said, it's a shame on you. That's not a human being. That's a money making machine you're talking about. Human being has a self interest, of course, but the bulk of it, what human being has is a collective interest. Human mm -hmm. beings are driven by self-interest and collective interest. But the collective interest is completely forgotten in economics. You do it only your personal interest. As a result, we created the world today, which is about to collapse now, end with the global warming. We don't have much time left. And I say human being today, because thanks to our businesses, thanks to our economics, human being is becoming the most endangered species on the planet right now. Mm -hmm because we have no chance. And second thing, not only global warming, also extreme and ugly wealth concentration. All the wealth of the world is concentrated up in the sky in the hands of few people, the top people in the world. 1% of population of the entire world own 99% of the wealth of the entire world. So you reverse, you flip it, is a 99% of the people have to live with 1% of the uh, wealth. 
So you have a wealth on the top and the people at the bottom at the low income level, $1 a day, $2 a day, $5 a day. For $5.50 a day, you have half the population under $5.50 a day. And if you go to $10 a day, oh, you got another group of people very close to $5.50, but uh, they're very close to $5.50. You go to $100 per day, you are above and it's becoming rare now. $1,000 a day, you become extremely rare. You go to $100,000 a day, you're way above. But all the wealth up there, if you look for the wealth, wealth is not here. 1% wealth is right here. So people are condensed and people are pushed into one bottom line, or one uh, the bottom, and all the wealth at the rooftop, or not to the rooftop, the sky top is there. So the big gap between the wealth and the human being. I said the real economics should be created to bring wealth and people together, not pushing wealth in one way, people in another way. And that's what our businesses do. Mm -hmm. So I said, that we have to redesign the entire business from it. That's what I did, the social business, and also entire financial system. Financial system, which is responsible for this grand distance between the people and the wealth. So unless you redesign the entire banking system, this will continue. And I said, this is a ticking time bomb. It will explode and destroy the whole human civilization and human on this planet. Lord Hastings, would you like to ask Professor Yunus a couple of questions? Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Professor Yunus, one of the reasons your model works, it seems to me, is that you ascribe a lot of integrity and honor to the women, to the people that you work with, to those that who borrow from the bank. And that, that implies you have a great faith in humanity despite what you've just been saying about the strangeness of our very divided world system, but you have a great faith in humanity. And where does that come from within you? And do you feel, as you've expanded, Grameen, into the US and into other territories, do you have the same optimism about honor and integrity as you do about how you develop the bank in Bangladesh? Yeah, I don't use the word honor, dignity or anything. I said the human being behave like this. This is their natural things. But banks, as I said, I learned from the banking. Whatever banks do, I do the opposite. Banks accept that all human beings who come to them is a cheat. So they have to buy, bring their lawyers first before they talk to this person. So I said, no, I don't do that. I say it's a real human being. So we can talk to each other, do business with each other, anything. I don't need a lawyer in the bank. So we have a banking system where there's no lawyer. We lend out to Grameen Bank alone in Grameen Bank in Bangladesh, which has a 9 million borrowers, 97% women. Today, we lend out over $3 billion worth of Bangladeshi currency every year with no piece of any legal paper. And the money comes back. <laughs> so I hate them as it is not about dignity. These are words pushed by somebody else. These are real human beings. You are a human person. You need money. I give you money. You give me back. Where's the lawyer? They said, no, no. It's the small money. So it can come back. It, it's, they want to. For them, it's not a small money. For them, it's bigger than a billion dollars because that's the only thing mm -hmm. they have. So you don't say that there's small money. For you, it's small money. For them, it's a huge money. But in total, it's $3 billion. It's not a small money. I'm giving $3 billion without any papers, without any lawyers. And it's having a good sleep at night, not worrying about are they going to pay back because they have been paying back over 40 years. And now we take it to United States. We started in 2008 in Jackson Heights, New York, in the first branch. Now we have 24 branches in 15 cities, New York, Boston, Houston, Los Angeles, San Francisco, 15 cities we work in 25 branches we have with 150,000 borrowers now. It took us... 10 years to build up $1 billion in loan to these people. And because their starting loan is $500, $600, that this is the beginning. But the repayment is 100%, no problem. And throughout our history of the last 12 years, 12 plus years, 12, 13 years now, we have lent with 99.5% and above repayment record. No document, nothing. And these are all slum dwellers, the, the, the people who need $500 and this kind of thing. And no identity, no I, I papers for them, undocumented people, because they are mostly immigrants and so on, there's no paper. So I lend money, billion dollar plus, to people who don't even 
not only didn't give any paper to me, they don't have any document to identify. If they disappear, nobody will know who they come from. But it works. These are people who don't speak my language. I don't speak their language. They can't speak a word of English. Most of them speak Spanish and other languages um, they, they come from, but they, all the immigrants. And today, uh, in, uh, we took, I said, about 10 years to build a $1 billion loan. Now we come to a stage in the 11th and 12th year, we are lending over a billion dollars each year. So this is the end same record and with the financially sustainable system. We follow exactly the same thing we do in Bangladesh. So people say, are you crazy? You do things what Bangladeshi women do in the United States? I said, of course, these are all human beings. I said, they may speak differently. They don't even look different. They're, they're, they're same people. Just same way, they cry the same way, they laugh the same way, the same thing. So this is how we look at it. It's not about uh, uh, dignity or anything. It's a real human being. You go, not only United States, we too, Throughout the world, we have all over Europe, you have microcredit program. France has a nationwide program. Sweden has microcredit. Germany has microcredit. Italy has microcredit. So now we have a Japan that has microcredit. So the, you don't feel that people at the bottom need banking finance. Banking things. They had no record of any kind. And now we created a record for them. They have a good score, uh, credit score now, because they are paying so precisely. So this is the system. So I've learned a lot from bank. Learned a lot. Just give us, um, if you could, if if your mind could go to maybe just one story, one woman, right. and you saw her go from the basic loan right the way through to however yeah. success is defined. Just give us one story. Yeah, it's a, it's a common story almost for everybody. You start very small with the thirty dollars, twenty dollars loan. Now borrowing fifteen thousand dollar. $20,000 loan, that's the space they have covered already. And then along the way, we encourage them to uh, send their children to school because they themselves, those 9 million borrowers, 97% women, I said, they're illiterate. They cannot read, they cannot write. Mm -hmm. But they do the banking quite perfectly. They have no problem with that. Uh, so, but we wanted to make sure their children do not repeat what their parents have been doing. So we encourage them to send their children to school. And then we gave them scholarships to stay in school, encourage them to have good performance. Then we started giving education loan for every single child who goes to college. So now we have hundreds of thousands of young people in college. Now we gave us, and then continue to give scholarships. They have graduated, now became graduates. They became master's degree. Some have PhDs, engineers, doctors, coming from illiterate, totally illiterate family, mm -hmm. not a sing, not in any generation. They had any history of literacy. Now out of that, they're becoming, and some of them are te teaching in the United States uh, universities, coming from that kind of situation. So this is a common thing. It's not a special how whole generation has changed. Then we brought the uh, telephone in the Bangladesh. We created a company called Grameen Phone uh, in 1997. For the first time, mobile phone came to the country and we are the leader of that. And our commitment was, and we declared, we bring the phone for the rural areas, not for the cities. Because always people thought phone for the cities, big guys, big businesses, no. We bring it to the rural areas. And for the rural women. So we started launching our program with the rural women mm -hmm. and coming bank borrow the other women. So we give her a loan to buy herself a telephone and start the service of telephone in the village. She makes money by offering the service of a telephone. People need to call. So who else, who would give them a chance to make a phone call? She's the only one who is in the village. So she has starts a booth. It's like a public booth now. People come to her home and make phone calls. And if you want a house call, if you, if you want me to come to your house, I charge heavy because you are asking me to. Come. So I make money by doing that. If, if somebody has a telephone, one of these ladies' telephone, within two years, she is way above from poverty because she makes so much money just by phone telephone. She's an illiterate person, but she handles telephone very well. And we call them telephone ladies. And Grameen Phone became a very successful company because very soon we have about a couple of million telephone ladies in Bangladesh, holding telephone in their hand. Telephone service becomes such a popular thing. Everybody wanted to have telephone, we made, made it so cheap. So this is another one, the power came not as a, a kind of money, also ideas of businesses, technologies in their hand, and healthcare, and everything that we did. Thank you. I'll hand back to Professor Craig. Thank you so much. Thank you. Professor Yunus, uh, 
with our final few minutes, what would your right. final advice be to our young people, to these students, as they face their life ahead and face enormous challenges in the world? Well, first of all, I'll draw attention to what I just said, that we are uh, on the way out, meaning the world is uh, not going to sustain itself because of the global warming, because of the wealth concentration, and because of artificial intelligence. Because artificial intelligence coming in a very heavy way, uh, replacing human beings in the workplace in all kinds, not just in the factories or offices. Uh, there will not be professors, human professors, there will be artificial professors. There will be artificial thinkers, there will be artificial writers, there will be artificial journalists, everything will be artificial intelligence because they do a better job than human beings. So my question is, if everything is replaced by, every, by artificial uh, intelligence, what will be the role of human being on this planet? I said, I see very clearly human being gradually pushed into a situation. They become the garbage on this world. They have no use. They simply consume and make a pollute, pollution of this planet. So artificial intelligence, then, since they are smart, they will call up their uh, pest control department I said, get this pest out of this planet, out, we don't need them, because we don't need it for anything. I said, that's the scenario, it's a scenario, we may ignore it, but this is the direction we are going. So unless we are aware of what the artificial intelligence is coming with, we have to make sure. So these are the three things that I mentioned that world has come to a stage, we don't have much time left. Our global warming saying that uh, we don't have much time, because the moment we get to the two degrees Celsius, we are out, finished. Uh, and, uh, and the wealth concentration is saying that not only now 1% for all those billions of people at the bottom, it will become is shrinking. That 1% is becoming smaller, that 99% is becoming bigger, and it, it, it will be untenable for uh, the distance between the wealth and the people. So this all this together, we don't have much chance. So we have to create a new world. This world is a no-go. We cannot continue with this path. So if you don't continue, we have to find a new path to go to a new world. We have to create a new world. And I try to explain to young people that for me, I said, I have defined my new world. It would be a world of three zeros. Zero net carbon emission, that's the world I want to build. And I hope young people will join in that for, to create a world of three zeros. That should be your mission of life. Because old people will not understand, they will not get into it. They will make all the compromises, but never will deliver. That's why young people are marching on the street, calling themselves Fridays for Future saying that, telling their parents that you're a totally responsible person, you stole my future. Children accusing their parents that you stole my future because you are pushing me into a dangerous world that you have created. I said, that's not the world we want to have. We want to hand over the world as a safer world, better world for children and grandchildren, not make it worse for them. So this is the world that we have to create. Zero net carbon emission, zero wealth concentration. Wealth will be together with people, not such a way. It can be done. This is, we know how to do it. Simply, we are not going in that direction. We know our house is burning, but we are having a party inside the house. We are enjoying the global prosperity and all these things. We ignore the fire in that. And we want to create a zero unemployment because artificial intelligence is creating 100% unemployment. We want to create zero unemployment. This is the world we want to break. And that's what the young people can do because older generation have got to, uh, kind of addicted to the world world. So we have to get them, uh, get the young people to remain unaddicted to them so that they know the world doesn't need making money. Making money is not bringing them happiness, it's bringing them uh, to put them into their death path, suicidal path. So they should get out of the suicidal path and discover my, themselves as a human being. That's a core word. As a human being who is not only driven by self-interest, which is a small part of human being, but a collective interest. How to design world for the whole, for all the people, not just for yourself. And you can design it, you can do it, provided you can put your mind into it. And last one I would say, never get a job because human beings are born as an entrepreneur. Economics pushed us in the wrong direction. We are not, produce, we are not born to take orders for somebody. We are a free human being. We do the things which we want. We imagine the things we want to imagine and go for our imagination. Imagination is our power. And we want to make our imaginations come true. That's our job. That's what the human beings are born for. As an entrepreneur, you change the world. As a job seeker, you don't change the world. We just continue the world, make it worse. Mm -hmm. 
Professor Yunus, our deepest thanks to you. You've given us much to think about and you've Thank given you. the entire world a pathway of hope. Thank you for your life and the dedication of your life and work. We wish you the very best. We hope to keep in touch with you on behalf of our students and our broader Would audience. Like give you our deepest thanks. And in behalf Thank now you. of the Stephen R. Covey Leadership Center at the John M. Huntsman School of Business at Utah State University, we wish you all a very good day and see you next time in this series the world's principled leaders. Thank you.